Hi, I'm Julie. I'm a writer and a storyteller. Since I consider myself a storyteller, I like to consume all forms of media, such as books as well as TV shows and movies. So I wanted to start a film journal to document some of the more interesting shows that I've seen, and that's what this series is. I'm starting with the Loki show on Disney+, Plus, which I will be doing three videos on to cover the total of six episodes that the show plans to release. So I've loved the MCU for basically my whole life, and I have a special place in my heart for Loki. Maybe it's because I've always liked misunderstood characters, characters who are just filled with the potential to be better. So to say I was stoked about this show was an understatement. But when the first episode actually came out, I couldn't bring myself to watch it until the day after it occurred. I was afraid what was going to be done with Loki, his character, and more importantly, how this show was going to shape the future of the MCU. But the first episode was great for easing me into it. We followed the pattern of the last two Marvel Disney Plus shows, and the protagonist, in this case Loki, got a little therapy, though Mobius technically isn't a therapist, rather Loki's biggest fan. Still, even though there wasn't a whole lot of action this episode, there were discussions of topics that made me quite existential that de delved into the realm of metaphysics. Even though we haven't seen much of this show yet, it feels bigger than not only the last two Disney Plus shows, but in my opinion, the last 10 years of the MCU combined. And that was its intention. Later in the video, I glued down a photo of the pile of infinity stones and put paperweights in quotations. This realization is not only devastating to Loki, but also to us as the viewers. We've spent the last decade of our lives thinking about Thanos and the Infinity Stones, and we thought that was the greatest power in the universe. But now, in this show, Loki is going up against not necessarily time, but time is a factor, but destiny. The idea that everyone has a singular chosen path, and that nothing they will ever do will deviate that pa them from that path. And the facilitators of this destiny are, in Loki's words, three space lizards. To us and to Loki, that's ridiculous, but to Mobius and the TVA, it's just the way of life. As Loki pokes holes in these philosophies and beliefs, it reminds me of metaphysics, which, if you don't know, is a branch of philosophy which examines reality and its relation to the human mind. In metaphysics, you explore the concepts of religion and gods, and what I recall is that there's no rational reasoning to explain the existence of gods. They are incompatible with reality as metaphysics looks at it. And so this belief that we have in our gods or Mobius has in the timekeepers is inherently illogical. Still, the belief persists. Loki's beliefs are different. He is the figure that people believe in, that people light candles and pray to. He has no reason to believe in anything but himself. And here he gets taken in by some organization he didn't know existed and told that he has had one path his whole life. Any time he, that he deviated, his variant being was destroyed, and he has had more variants than almost anyone else in the universe. For Loki, these realizations are absolutely devastating. He thought he was the higher power, and he's not. Then Mobius sits him down and forces him to watch his quote-unquote true self live out his years after the Battle of New York. He's rejected by his father, verbally and explicitly, after centuries of neglect and put in a prison cell. His worst fears are coming true. Loki watches his mother, the only person who he has ever truly connected with, die. Then he sees himself become not only allied with Thor, but he sees the relationship become something new. True, equal respect for another and what they can do. Thor finally accepts Loki in all of his glory with his mischief and deception. 
And then Loki faces Thanos, who is arguably his worst enemy, and who canonically manipulated and possibly tortured him pre-Battle of New York, and Loki dies by Thanos' hand. But that's not the end of the file. Loki's last moments weren't Thanos' hand around his throat. They were on the ground of a destroyed ship with whoever remained of Asgard, with his brother crying over his death, his real death. Then the ship blows up, and for all Loki knows, Thor died on that ship too. After all that introspection and reflection, Loki breaks down. He doesn't want to hurt people. It's just all part of the show. It's posturing, a show of power. I know a lot of people thought that ep this episode was slow, but it really hit me on a deep level. Loki has had a dedicated fan base for years, and a lot of us hoped, believed, that there was more to Loki than what was being presented, and that this episode, there is something more. He's essentially a broken boy, who is doomed to always be a side character that propels the greats into being heroes. I gave the episode a 9 because I'm saving my 10 just in case, but I was both excited and nervous for what was to come. So all that talk of that singular path gave me a whole lot of anxiety for the coming episodes. Until episode 2, I was sure that Wanda was going to be the one to break the timeline. After all, she was revealed to be a Nexus level being in WandaVision. Wanda has a massive effect on probability, which, by extension, affects the universal time stream. So with that in mind, I wasn't expecting the timeline to break in this show, you know, despite it being a show about time travel. But the fact that it happened in episode two was a huge curveball for me. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The thing I absolutely loved about this episode was that we could see Loki's personality come through. Not the one that he put on during the Thor movies, well the first two Thor movies, or during the Avengers. The real Loki is a creative problem solver who evaluates every situation in seconds and is basically always right in his assessment. And he still has that wonderful Loki snark that we all love. However, this episode did give me a little pause, some nerves. I had the voice of Dylan is in trouble in my head going, It's a misdirect! On one hand, Loki seems to be surprisingly truthful and cooperative, but on the other hand, Loki is the god of mischief and lies. It's crazy, but also so telling of his intellect, the amount of problems Loki solved in what felt like the first day at the TVA. With the apocalypse thing, to how he realized the other variant was setting a trap, even when no one believed him. With the mention of Loki's intellect, we have to talk about what Loki's endgame could be. He's being cooperative because he allegedly wants to take over the TVA. Yes, that could absolutely be what Loki is aiming towards. I also think there might be something else at play. Thinking about Loki and what we know about him, what he craves isn't power, but rather validation and respect. I mean, think about in Ragnarok when Loki was living as Odin, king of Asgard. Thor the Dark World had seemed to hint that Loki was an evil mastermind with evil plans, when in actuality he had no such plans. As L Odin, Loki had the respect and validation, even if it wasn't directed towards him. By all accounts, he was harmless. Especially instead of murdering his father, like you'd expect from someone who was evil, Loki put him in a retirement home. A retirement home. Which, you know, doesn't really scream evil mastermind to me. So, I admit, I don't really know what Loki's endgame is, nor do I know what side he's going to be on when it ends. But I'm rooting for him, and I hope that he can forge his own path and become the hero of his own story. So, let me know in the comments below what you guys think Loki's endgame might be in this situation. 
I am interested to see what happens on the excursion where Loki followed Lady Loki through that time portal, and I hope he comes back in that dashing outfit that we've all seen in the trailers and that everyone is cosplaying. So let's talk about Sylvie La Fay Daughter, aka the Lady Loki. The first thing we definitely have to talk about is the fact that she's blonde. In every iteration of the comics, whenever Loki has taken their female form, their female form has always had black hair. So this spawns the theory that Sylvie, Lady Loki, might actually be Enchantress from the comics. But while I'm interested in that theory, I also have to wonder why the TVA would mistake her for Loki. The TVA is all-knowing, apparently, so if they're all-knowing, how could they mistake the Enchantress for a Loki variant? And more importantly, I'm interested to see what reality this Loki variant has lived that has led them to want to destroy the TVA and not take over it like Loki does. I'm wondering how long have they been a variant and what persuaded them to take this specific form, especially with the blonde hair. Is it because Loki's mother dies or maybe something else has happened? What I'm basically saying is that there has to be a reason why this has happened, why this Loki variant stands out against all the others. And if that Loki variant is in fact the Enchantress, that makes sense, because in our knowledge, there have been dozens, probably hundreds of Loki variants, and not one of them has gone against the TVA like this, been able to escape, and is in fact causing trouble for the TVA. Also, a fun side note, I like how in this time travel sci-fi genre, the whole world has decided there's only two ways that people can mess with slash keep track of time. You're either a vintage bureaucracy or you're a bunch of idiots with a time machine. And you know what? I love that for humanity. So anyway, I'm going to take a little break from my thoughts, analysis on Loki, and talk a bit about what I'm doing in my bullet journal. So on the right corner in the white writing, I have written a whole bunch of my thoughts and stuff on the Loki episodes, and, you know, just thoughts, feelings, whatnot. And so right now what I'm doing is I'm stamping the paperweights that I mentioned earlier, because that really struck a chord with me, especially going forward in the MCU, of how the world's greatest threat has now been reduced to what is nothing. They're nothing but paperweights. And initially, this paperweights concept kind of feels like bad storytelling, because it's saying, oh, all those stakes that you remember all those people that died for these stones and revolving around the stones, that was for nothing. But I can also see it from the Marvel perspective of having to one-up their big bad from the last time. So while one part of me was kind of hurt by this scene, I also totally understood what they were going for and where they were coming from. And I think it just paints a broader picture of what they're building up to, specifically in Spider-Man No Way Home and um, Doctor Strange, The Multiverse of Madness. Because at least I think this means that they're not just building up to a single linear story anymore. The first 10 years of the MCU was building up a single story and how all these other stories were just small parts of that greater story. 
But in this case, in dealing with the multiverse, it's not about a single story anymore. It's not about the connections. It's more about how vast and different and scary the MCU is going to be. Which kind of brings me into a topic I've been thinking about since I watched the first Loki episode. So, in some of the welcome narration, Miss Minutes mentions the vast multiversal war that the timekeepers essentially solved into a single continuous time stream. While that might be nothing more than just like exposition for the timekeepers and why the TVA was established, to me it kind of feels like foreshadowing, especially since we know that Multiverse of Madness is specifically going to be dealing with the consequences of suddenly being a part of a multiverse. As you can see, I'm writing down some of my thoughts for the future of the MCU right now. And it's interesting, you know, because when we were first told about this multiverse arc that was coming, we were told that it starts with WandaVision, continues with Loki, continues with Spider-Man No Way Home, and the culmination of this arc would be in Doctor Strange, The Multiverse of Madness. And I know this is a Loki video, but follow me here for a second. If this arc was supposed to start in WandaVision, why didn't it? Sure, we got the impression that her powers are more vast than anyone in the MCU had been expecting. And we got the Dark Hold, which is, you know, lots of dark magic and it's very worrying and concerning. And we got this teaser where Peter Maximoff was played by Evan Peters. Sorry, I meant Pietro Maximoff. And then it turns out that Evan Peters' character is not, as we all thought, being the X-Men Quicksilver. And he's just some guy. I don't know. It's just... Why would they put so much emphasis on how the multiverse begins with Wanda if the person who in fact breaks the current timeline and starts the multiverse is Lady Loki, therefore making Loki the beginning of the multiverse arc. But hey, you more cultured Marvel fans can let me know in the comments below because I don't read the comics very often, so y'all might know something that I don't. I guess what I'm saying is, is that, at least for me, something's not adding up. And yes, we are just at the beginning of this, and it might be one of those things where you have to wait till the end before you can see the bigger picture. But... There's just, there's something off in this world. It doesn't make sense. Speaking of, let's talk Avengers. Loki brings up a great point before the judge that the Avengers are the ones who time traveled, so why weren't they dragged in by the TVA? The TVA's response to this is that, oh, the Avengers were always supposed to do that. Which, you know, since they were always supposed to do that, it kind of brings up a whole lot more plot holes than Endgame originally established, which were already a lot of plot holes. Like, one plot hole that I'm going to clear up right now that I've been seeing around a lot is the fact that, oh, Loki stole the Tesseract, so the Avengers weren't always supposed to go back in time to steal the Pym Particles and the Tesseract. But we have to remember that Loki wasn't the direct cause of Tony losing the Tesseract. Hulk bumping into Tony made him lose the Tesseract. And I suppose, in the normal reality, Loki didn't steal the Tesseract, and just S.H.I.E.L.D. or Hydra got the Tesseract. But I will say that I am on Loki's side when it comes to this Avengers thing. Like, something is just not sitting right here. 
like, why would the timekeepers see and write in time travel into the original time stream? It's so dangerous and can create all these timelines and alternate realities that they're trying so hard to prevent. So why are the Avengers given a hall pass? Is it maybe because these timekeepers aren't as all-powerful as the TVA makes them out to be? Maybe there's something even over the timekeepers that's dictating their actions and motives. And also, speaking of Avengers, Doctor Strange saw, what, 16 million different realities, allegedly, and so, what, that one singular timeline was the only one that the timekeepers dictated to be part of the sacred timeline? And also, in these different realities, did Steven see variants of themselves getting arrested by the TVA? Does Doctor Strange know about the TVA? Because if he has that time stone, I can't think of a reality where he doesn't know about the TVA. Really, I'd like to get into those textbooks that they have at the Sanctums and at Camartage, because they have to have something about the Time Keepers. There's no way that these are these ancient mystical beings, and wizards and sorcerers don't know about them. What can I say? I'm with Loki, man. These space lizards, they don't sit right with me. I just, I can't fathom them operating on their own. I really feel like there's something bigger going on in a story arc that's already massive. But hey, it's just the first two episodes. And I'm really excited that it was these two episodes that were the first pages in my film journal and as you can see I'm putting two more photos in um, the one in the middle which is very very dark and you cannot see it is Loki and Mobius and I thought that was important so I decided to put the words um, apocalypse epiphany next to them because it's the scene where Loki is doing a very vivid, <laughs> very vivid uh, metaphor for the apocalypse that he's trying to explain to Mobius. It's very chaotic, and I think it's beautiful. Side note, I think the lo knowledge of Ragnarok affected Loki a lot more than it seemed to affect him. And as we're coming up to the image of Lady Loki, I have to once again reiterate that I do not trust this woman, this god. I don't, I just, mm -mm. she doesn't feel like Loki at all. So either she's not, or she went through some crazy shit that we're going to find out about. Well, as we're coming to the end of this video... I have to thank you for sticking it out with me and, you know, keep those theories coming in the comments below and, um, you know, we'll be back in two weeks to talk about episodes three and four. Next week, I have a Shadow and Bone video coming. Um, which I'm very excited about. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.